pleasure and honor for me to be here. Uh, it's wonderful to be in Barcelona. It's not my first time, but third time, and I really enjoy also being in this wonderful space located here. So, um, my presentation today is about landscape fragmentation. I was asked to give an overview. Why does it matter? What is it? Let's look at some examples. This is an example from southern Germany, a landscape shown in 1956. And Albrecht Brugger managed to go to the same spot a few years later, 1989. And you see a very strongly modified landscape with lots of urban sprawl happening, large roads in there. This is the outline of my talk. First, I want to present to you some important effects of landscape fragmentation, then tackle the question how to measure landscape fragmentation, talk a little bit about, about, about mitigation measures, and then try to conclude with 10 lessons. And uh, about this uh, drawing here, the striking feature of this drawing is it's not new. It was done in 1964. So the problem we are talking about really is an old problem, and we are still suffering from it. Um, here's an example from Switzerland. You all know where Switzerland is. Uh, and this is a map of Switzerland in 1885, which shows the sizes of the fragments. All the barriers in the landscape, such as roads and urban areas, are shown in black. Railway lines, for example. And then the patches uh, have certain sizes, and the colors indicate their size. So large patches are shown in green. Orange patches are pretty small. And red patches are pretty tiny. Here's an example of a black area. That's Geneva. The cities are shown in black here. And uh, to get this map, we had to digitize old maps. So this really is the situation more than 100 years ago. That's true. Very good. Thanks. That's helpful. So here is Zurich. Here is Basel. Here is Bern, and so on. So now watch how the landscape has changed. This is 1935. This is 1960. This is 1980. This, this is 2002. So as you see, these patches have shrunken quite a bit. And uh, of course, the landscape is changing at a very rapid pace. And it's still ongoing. So as a result, wildlife populations are increasingly enmeshed by roads and railway lines and urban areas. As a result, we have more frequent encounters with wildlife. So this is an example from Canada. So it shows you Canadian street gang. Of course, this also results in a huge loss of wildlife through uh, wildlife mortality. And sometimes it becomes difficult to recognize these critters on the road. So that's why there is a field guide out there called Flat and Fauna, a field guide to common animals of roads, streets, and highways. And it shows you certain shapes of animals. And you can compare that with the signs on the road uh, to identify those critters. It's uh, written with lots of black humor. <laughs> However, the issue of traffic mortality is really important. This is an example from Eastern Germany, where they did a study about otters being killed and compared that with all types of mortality. And they found that it's almost 60% of mortality in otters caused by traffic. So traffic mortality for many critters is a serious source of um, threat. However, it's not only a threat for animals. It's also a problem for humans. This is an example from Germany, when you hit a bunch of wild boar with your cars, or even larger critters. This is important in the sense that this is an issue that ministries of transportation are worried about. So sometimes you can get money for research when you address traffic traffic safety issues, and then you try to sneak in issues of wildlife protection in the same project. So what are the mechanisms of roads and traffic? How do they affect wildlife populations? Well, there are four major effects, among others. The first one here is habitat loss. And you have the road effect zone, which Richard Foreman has published about a lot. Because habitat loss is not just the surface of the road, but also the effects extending from the road, such as noise and light and so on. 
second one is traffic mortality, which we've just talked about. The third one is road avoidance or barrier effect. So animals may not be able to cross the road, for example, if it's fenced, or animals that would physically be able to cross the road may not want to do so because it's perceived as a risk or as a disturbance, so they may avoid the road from some distance or they don't have um, protection from predators and so on. And the point now is that all these processes are always detrimental for the animals. So they will reduce population size, and at some point they will reduce the probability of population persistence. When you combine these two effects, two effects traffic mortality and road avoidance, you get what is also called a population subdivision. So you're dividing up the landscape into smaller patches. And the problem now becomes when these roads are a barrier, that this patch of habitat uh, cannot be recolonized once it's empty. You have small populations in smaller patches, so they are fluctuating quite a bit and can easily go extinct. And if this piece of habitat is not accessible anymore because the road is a barrier or it's fenced, then even though if it's very nice habitat, very high quality, it may be useless for the population because they cannot access it anymore. So inaccessible habitat is kind of lost habitat. And as you know, habitat loss is the biggest uh, problem, the biggest issue, biggest cause of extinctions of species. So as a result, fragmented populations have a higher risk of extinction. If you fragment the landscape more and more, you will lose more and more uh, animals, and the populations will be at higher risk. The reasons are several, one of which is demographic stochasticity. If you have large populations and they fluctuate, they will still not go extinct because they are far away from zero over time. However, if you have a population, it fluctuates and it's closer to zero, so it may easily go to zero, which means it's extinct, and then it's gone. Um, the other problem I mentioned is lack of recolonization of empty habitats, once empty habitats once habitats go empty because the population is so small, it cannot be recolonized if the barrier is too strong. And many animals also need different habitat types to complete their life cycle, two or three or four different habitat types, for example, breeding habitat and overwintering habitat. And if they can't get from one habitat type to the other across the barrier, then they cannot survive. So one question then becomes, what happens if we put more and more barriers into the landscape, more and more roads, for example? It will reduce population persistence probability. However, how does this work? So if we have a diagram and put roads on the x-axis, road density, and show on the other axis population viability, what would you expect the relationship to look like? Would you expect to see a linear relationship going down like this, or would you expect a threshold? So that's a real question. What do you expect? So make your choice. You don't have to tell me, but make your choice. Ready? So that was one of the questions I looked at during my postdoc, and I did a computer simulation model for it, and to study this research questions. Are there thresholds in the effect of road density on the viability of wildlife populations? And I used a simulation model, a spatially explicit, individual-based, stochastic simulation model, where the landscape is represented by a grid like this. So the road is in the center, and four things can happen when animals move around in the landscape. So either they move and they don't encounter the road, then they are fine. Maybe they move and they successfully traverse, trans, uh, traverse the road. Or they move and avoid the road, so in the model they are just reflected at the road. Or they try to cross and they get killed by traffic. Those are the four things. And I won't tell you about all the details about the model, I just tell you about the result. And it looks like this. So that means the more roads you put into your landscape, uh, the more population viability will be reduced, but it follows a threshold. So that means at first, the population will still survive. So you add roads and add roads. And then you may think, well, it survived the previous roads. Why not add three or four more roads? But the problem is, if you're close to the threshold, suddenly the population may go extinct. 
Now, this would be nice information to have for planning, right? Um, well, you can try to look at some empirical data. This is an example from Switzerland looking at brown hair. So here's row density measured, and here is hair abundance. And you see a pretty strong relationship in this situation. As you can see, at some point, abundance will go down to zero right here at this row density, right? So hair populations are not only affected by roads, it's many other things, agricultural intensification and so on, but roads are an important part of the story. So what we would like to have is the knowledge how much is too much, how much road density is too much. So our wish would be if in an ideal world we have our degree of fragmentation and we know pop population persistence probability and then we would just say, well, we are still fine with, say, 90% or 95% or 99% uh, persistence probability over so many generations, maybe 30 generations. And then we would say, this is the maximum level of allowed fragmentation. Then we could plan with this. So planners love thresholds. However, we don't know. We don't know this answer. We have some idea for some species, and here's the complete, almost complete list of what we know for these species. So species like wolves, elk, black bear, bull trout, and some others. We know those thresholds, but of course there are many more species out there. So that means for most species we don't know where the threshold is, and even for these species, we don't know this threshold. What we know is when do they disappear? So that's this threshold. And that's a different threshold. When we use this threshold, that's far too late because at this point, species will go extinct. If they are still around at this level of degree of fragmentation, that means they are just still declining and will go extinct in a few years or maybe in a few decades. So this threshold is too much already. So we have to find some different way of dealing with this. Well, there are quite a number of effects of landscape fragmentation. Uh, in particular of roads, but other elements as well. And you can group them into seven themes, land cover, local climate, emissions, water, flora and fauna, landscape scenery, and land use. But I don't have enough space to talk about all of these, so that's why I'll just show you a summary, which looks like this. And because you can't read this, I will hand out a paper copy. If you may just take a sheet, and then you can read up on it. Um, so I'm just highlighting a few examples from this one section here, flora and fauna. And if you want to read more on it, I recommend this report to you, Landscape Fragmentation in Europe, where you find more information. So how are we dealing with these environmental effects in environmental impact assessment? Well, this was one question in this review paper uh, by Gontier et al. By biodiversity and environmental assessment, current practice and tools for prediction. And the main result of this paper is that first, biodiversity assessment was confined to local scales only, which does not allow the assessment of, of the effects of habitat loss and fragmentation. Second, there is a lack of quantifications and methods for impact predictions. And third, for the development, it, it seems that development and implementation of new methods is necessary to tackle this problem. So basically the message is, in real environmental impact assessments, we are doing pretty bad.